The Discoverers, Chapter 15, Part 2. The Crusades would be one of the most miscellaneous, most unruly movements in history. A portent of things to come was Peter the Hermit. He was appropriately miscalled the Hermit because he usually wore a hermit's cape. But he was by no means a hermit, for he loved crowds and knew how to move them. Peter set up his own corps of recruiting agents and began gathering his motley pilgrim army in the county of Berry in central France. By the time he reached Cologne in western Germany on the Holy Saturday, April 12, 1096, some 15,000 pilgrims of all ages, sexes, and shapes, sizes, had joined his party. All the West and all the barbarian tribes from beyond the Adriatic as far as the Pillars of Hercules, a Byzantine princess, Anna Comenina, fearfully reported, were moving in a body through Europe toward Asia, bringing whole families with them. The arrival of Peter's horde at Constantinople brought new troubles. There they joined forces with Walter the Penniless and moved on toward the holy city, plundering as they went. One group under Renald, an Italian nobleman, sacked Christian villages en route, tortured their inhabitants, and were even reported to roast Christian babies on spits over open fires. The Byzantine emperor, Alexis I, tried to persuade adventuring knights to submit to his rule, but the more ambitious of them conquered and pillaged to establish new kingdoms of their own. These Christian forces defeated the Turks in several battles and entered Jerusalem in triumph in July 1099, so bringing to an end what came to be called the First Crusade. Jerusalem was speedily reorganized into a new Latin kingdom. This was only the beginning of the hectic movement that lasted two centuries to make secure the way of the pilgrims. But in one sense, too, it was the end of the Crusades, for it was the last successful expedition to redeem the holy places. Later Crusades turned out to be only expeditions to help the Christians already established in the East. After the fall of Jerusalem to the Turkish Saladin in 1187, the more accessible holy destinations in the West attracted Christian pilgrims more than ever. For the faithful in Britain, the most sacred place was Canterbury. It was in Canterbury Cathedral where the second St. Augustine died, 604, had been the first archbishop, that Thomas a Becket championed the church against Henry II and was martyred on December 29, 1170. King Henry himself marked the pilgrim path where he journeyed there to do public penance. As soon as he neared the city, Roger of Hovenden, a contemporary chronicler, reported, in sight of the cathedral in which lay the body of the blessed martyr, he dismounted from his horse and having taken off his shoes with bare feet and dressed in woolen garments, he walked three miles to the tomb of the blessed martyr with such meekness and repentance that it really may be held to have been the work of him who looketh down on the earth and maketh it tremble. Chaucer gave the shrine of St. Thomas at Canterbury literary immortality by his description of 31 varieties of pilgrims. Thane longeth folk to goon on pilgrimages, and palmeras for the seeking strange throngs, the fairneth hath couth in sundry loans, and specially from every shrine endeth, of England to Canterbury they wend. After the Crusades came to an end, pilgrimage still remained a living force in European Christendom and for many Rome replaced Jerusalem. In 1300, in the spirit of Urban II, Pope Boniface VIII proclaimed the first Jubilee year, offered special indulgences to the faithful who visited Rome, and attracted more than 20,000 pilgrims. Jubilee years, with their attendant indulgences for pilgrims to Rome, continued every 50 years, till the Pope, in 1470, reduced the interval to 25 years. In Islam, from its very beginning, pilgrimage was a holy duty. Every good Muslim was and is obliged, if he can afford it and can support his family in his absence, 
to visit Mecca at least once. During the Hajj from the seventh to the 10th month of the Muslim year, the pilgrim wears two seamless white garments, symbols of equality before God. He neither shaves nor cuts his hair or nails during the ceremony. He must circumambulate the Kaaba seven times and follows certain other rites around Mecca before returning home. Forever after, the returned pilgrim is honored by the title of Haji. Mecca had been a place of pilgrimage for idolatrous Arabs centuries before Muhammad. They went for their annual festival to welcome the renewed year, to light bonfires to persuade the sun to rise, and to work charms to prevent drought. Mecca never ceased to be the Muslim pilgrim's goal, and in Western languages became a symbol for any goal of pilgrimage. In the late 20th century, the Hajj was so popular that some Muslim countries annually limited the number of outgoing pilgrims to avoid foreign exchange problems. By 1965, some one and a half million pilgrims were visiting Mecca each year, about half from outside Arabia. Ibn Battuta, 1304 to 1374, the greatest Muslim traveler of the Middle Ages, at the age of 21, left his home in Tangier at the northwestern tip of Africa as a pilgrim, swayed by an overmastering impulse and a desire long cherished to visit these illustrious sanctuaries. His popular chronicle of lifelong travel made him a kind of Muslim Marco Polo, celebrated as the traveler of Islam. Despite his rule never to travel any road a second time, he made four pilgrimages to Mecca. Although he covered some 75,000 miles, probably more than any other recorded traveler before his day, he visited every Muslim country in neighboring lands served as Muslim judge or Qadi in Islamic communities as far away as Delhi, the Maldive Islands, and Ceylon, and became an envoy from sultans to Chinese unbelievers. Still, his extensive travels were not an enticement into the unknown, but a kind of encyclopedia of Muslim life and customs in various climates and terrains. He showed how much a devout Muslim man of curiosity and energy could discover in a world if he was willing to move around to risk bandits, pirates, the Black Death, and the whims of despotic sultans. So he acquired a Muslim liberal education, but his imagination did not range far beyond Islam, and his learning was inhibited by his faith. In the heart of Asia, too, faithful crowds seeking the balm of their own holy places in route began to discover their world. No one knows exactly how, why, or when ancient Benars on the Ganges, some called it the most ancient city in the world, first became sacred. But by the 7th century, the city held a hundred temples to Shiva. In the 11th century, the Muslim Abiruni reported how Hindus venerated Benares. Their Angkorites wander to it and stay there forever, as dwellers of the Kaaba stay forever in Mecca, that their reward after death should be better for it. They say that a murderer is held responsible for his crime and punished with punishment due to his guilt, except in the case he enters the city of Benares, where he obtains pardon. The Buddhists, too, taught that the deer park at Sarnath, where the Buddha, circa 500 BC, had preached his first sermon, was a rung on the ladder to heaven. The North Indian emperor, Asoka, who converted to Buddhism about 200 BC, led pilgrimages to all the Buddhist sacred places. As he visited them, he repaired old shrines, stupas, and built new ones. Wherever he went, he erected commemorative stone pillars, many still standing. From remote corners of Asia, men and women, noble and peasant, scholar and illiterate, followed Asuka's footsteps. From the Chinese imperial capital of Xi'an on the Wai River in central China, the Buddhist enthusiast, Fa Haiyan, about AD 400, traversed deserts and mountain ranges to visit the Buddhist shrines in North India, then crossed the peninsula to enjoy the sanctity of the tooth of Buddha in Ceylon. India became a land of sacred places. According to the Buddha, 
all mountains, all rivers, holy lakes, places of pilgrimage, the dwellings of Sriz, Cowpens, and temples of the gods, are places which destroy sin. The cults of local spirits and countless local priesthoods multiplied till one traveler at Kashmir observed that there was not a space as large as a grain of sesame seed without a place of pilgrimage. And we'll pause here and we'll continue with this chapter in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the book. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.